How y'all doing today? It's your boy Jermaine from Shovel Nose Hogs back with another interview. And I have a special guest today um, back for his second interview with me, Kevin Rhodes. And so I'm going to give him a little time to introduce himself. And uh, there you go. Yeah, this is Kevin Rhodes, hognose1.com, uh, in partnership with uh, John Lynch over with High Plains Hognose. So, yeah, good to be back here hanging out with uh, Jermaine again and shoving those hogs. All right. So one of the main reasons why I wanted to do or we wanted to do uh, this interview is to promote your new book. And so I have a copy right here. So the hobbyist guide to the captive husbandry of the Western hog nose. So um, give us um, a rundown on this book and um, why you uh, why did you actually write this book? Yeah, you know, after the last uh, series of morph um, traits guide that I was that I was doing, I, I signed off and said no more books. It was just a, it's a lot of work and it's the pay is not there. You know, not like breeding animals or whatever. But um, one of the main reasons I did is because there's a lot of conflicting information within the hobby. Any uh, forum, chat room, wherever you go on, there's all kinds of all over the board information. You know, some of it's on one side of a spectrum, some of it's on another side. And then sometimes you just get information that is just totally off the wall and, you know, doesn't make any sense. So that was the reason for this book. And I talked to several people, several breeders worldwide about it. And a lot of those have requested, and it's even written in the book, you know, they requested not to be mentioned because some of the topics are controversial. Uh, but I wanted to address a lot of the things, and especially with this title uh, regarding disease and disorder, uh, that's something that we, you know, don't see a whole lot within the hognose community, something that uh, people are willing to talk about. I know you are very transparent with your, uh, you know, walk through some some hard times and, you know, losing some great animals. Uh, and I respect that, you know, and uh, hopefully this book will address some of those other issues that people really question, okay, is what I'm doing regarding husbandry okay? Is it not okay? Is it detrimental? Uh, things like that. So, you know, I took 17 different opinions that I felt like were presented at least over the last two years from people that were uh, valid and tried to answer those in just as moderate of fashion as we can. So then there's a lot of other information. We're not just focusing on 17 items. But that was the thought process behind um, creation of this title. Yeah, and uh, I actually uh, just finished reading the book. And like you said, you have the different opinions that some of them I've heard on Facebook pages and everything like that. But I like how you have it kind of broken down into the different categories, like husbandry, breeding, disease. And I feel like it's a book that not only can benefit like a novice, somebody that's just getting into the hobby, but also somebody that's more advanced, that's just trying to learn more and getting the, uh, getting opinions um, from, like you say, other breeders around the world. And um, upon reading the book, it was three things that I found just kind of jumped out at me. Um, these are some like points that I that it makes a lot of sense, but it's something that like I didn't even think about. Um, the first one was um, there's a section of the book where you talk about like air quality. Um, and you talked about how you now use aloe vera plants in your hog nose room to remove some of the toxins and I guess to increase the oxygen level um, in your hog nose room. And you found that to be beneficial because that's something that I never really thought about. And you kind of mentioned that it may not be a good idea for some people to keep their hog nose snakes in their garage because of like the exhaust from the car, um, the airflow might not be there. And that's something that probably a lot of people won't even think about. Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of us have to kind of, uh, you know, especially for family people or or whatever, the hognose snakes just go wherever we can. It may be a closet. I know people that keep them in their bathrooms, bedrooms, you know, spare rooms, whatever. And so uh, that was something that was kind of combined. I had a professor that um, when I went back to school a few years ago that was teaching about the, um, especially the succulents, how that they um you know pull in all kinds of toxins and they're able to remove those from the air so they really really improve air quality uh aloe vera is everywhere so it's a it's a very common plant 
uh, amongst other succulents that you can do and, and bring into a room. So what I saw with it was when I brought it in, it just in, improved the air quality, uh, you know, less smell from just ammonia and whatever. You, you get those smells, the more animals you have, especially having, you know, multiple animals that are concentrated in a smaller area, which we're able to do with these small, you know, fossorial species. But uh, once you concentrate those smells, even if you're doing daily, um, you know, spot cleaning or uh, cage cleaning or whatever, there's still uh, aromas that when you bring friends over, they're like, oh, man, this smells rank or this is an odd odor, you know, the musk or whatever. So that was actually something that a, that a professor that I, that I was friends with had uh, suggested and said, hey, maybe this is something that would work good for um, the... Um, you know, the um, hog nose trade or reptile trade or whatever like that. So, yeah, that was something really exciting that that uh, that we tried, uh, you know, as a point. I mean, the city of L.A. has talked about doing massive walls, uh, you know, of aloe vera and other succulents to uh, remove smog, you know. So why wouldn't it work on a small scale? And, and I think it's just, you know, it kind of borderlines with the, um, uh, the green footprint. You know, we want to leave a light footprint wherever we're at. We want to, you know, benefit in plants and animals. I mean, they've survived for millions of years, you know, together. And I just think it's just a brilliant thing to kind of, uh, you know, with the rise in bioactive enclosures and such, I think it, that, that kind of uh, piggybacks that uh, school of thought. Yeah. And so another point that you mentioned in the book that I thought was pretty cool was um, you were talking about um, eggs. So sometimes a hog nose may, may lay an egg and it's not completely, completely calcified. And uh, you said that maybe applying like calcium powder could improve that, especially if you have like a tear in the egg or something. Um, have you, is that something that you've uh, done personally and had like success with? Yeah, and actually, I mean, that's a brand new thing. You know, we talked about uh, a little while ago about um, advanced breeders kind of looking at something that they can, you know, pick up some cues from. This year, John Lynch and I decided that uh, within our individual collections, we were going to uh, look at all the information that we could find on hognose and try to be able to breed better and do, uh, you know, ha have a more efficient um system and just be open to new ideas i think a lot of times we get locked into these you know uh, schools of thought where we don't change anything and uh you just end up producing the same way you've always produced so that was one of the things that we kind of looked at um some of the clutches of eggs i had early on this year had um, just thin membranes where they weren't calcified and so i put some calcium powder on those and they actually hatched well. And I've had eggs in the past that when they got those on there, they began to sweat or rupture and it killed the egg. So I think that that's just something new that we're going to try with, uh, you know, just a light dose or a light uh, coating of that calcium powder. And it, I can verify this year that on several eggs, that was, uh, that was the case that I think it really saved that egg. So just something new we were trying, but it's something cool for sure. Yeah, that's that's definitely a great point. And like you say, you, I don't care how many years of experience you have. Um, there's always something new that you can try. And if you kind of just think about the hognose industry 20 or 25 years ago and where it is now in the advancements and the knowledge that we have, if you don't experiment, then things become stagnant and you don't advance the, the care of these animals. And, um, and I like in the book that you kind of have difference of opinions and you kind of go through different ways that different people do it. And you kind of emphasize that just because somebody does it one way, doesn't mean um, that's the, that's the set way. There's multiple ways in which you can do something. And um, I remember, I think in one of your videos, you kind of told this story and I, 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 I love this story where um, back in the day, you knew somebody that had a really, um, weird method of incubating eggs where he used a fish tank and then he kept the eggs in like a, what is it? A tuna can kind of uh, give us a rundown on that story. For some reason, I find it that fascinating. So this old uh, herper out in this area was one of the ones that taught me how to, um, you know, how to look for snakes, especially hognose. I mean, 
this guy found an albino hog nose in the wild, you know, on a dirt road that some ignorant farmer had chopped the head off of, you know, and he took pictures of it and then he, you know, brought it to me. And so saying all that, that to say, this guy was very dedicated reptile guy. So he and his friends would go out and catch snakes back in the seventies. So when I was a kid, um, I would hear stories about this guy. Well, by the time I got a driver's license, I just drove out to his house one time and start struck up a conversation. And he had all kinds of crazy animals, peacocks and, you know, pot belly pigs and had an actual like 600 pound wild boar, you know, that had tusks and all, and he could pet it like it was a cat, you know, it was the craziest, wildest thing. But his um, husbandry was just different than we ever know. And that's kind of what I wanted to describe in the book was that you don't always have to have the optimum or somebody's golden care guide, you know, to making something happen. If something's detrimental to the animal's health or your health, then yes, obviously it's, you know, it needs to be, uh, you know, revisited. But this particular guy hatched, or he had six little hog nose eggs and he was like, hey, come over here and he had this old, dirty, 20 gallon tall aquarium. And it had like two inches of water in the bottom. And then he had a like a fish tank heater um, plugged in. And it looked like it was just an electrical hazard. You know, it was just crazy looking. But had it plugged into the wall. And uh, he told me, you know, basically the water heats up. And um, he floated those six eggs inside of a tuna fish can uh, right on the surface tension of that water. And I was like, there's no way they're going to hatch because it had like dried tuna fish and rust on the can and, uh, you know, like an old star kiss tuna can. And I'm thinking there is no way in the world. And then about a month and a half later, you know, he calls me and says, hey, those hog nose hatched. And so I went back out and it was just cool seeing these little hog noses. You know, one of them had slipped out and was swimming in that warm water, you know, about, I guess, maybe 80 degrees or whatever. But just saying that, um, you know, I talk about in the book, too, there's I've gone out to landfills and walked around the edge and caught hognose snakes. So you can't say that animals can't survive or, or, or adapt, um, you know, to certain conditions that we wouldn't think otherwise favorable. And I think the same thing applies in captivity. All of us have something that we stand by it's our soapbox to preach and stand on you know and say this is the only way it works but the reality is there's lots of ways that an adaptable animal like a reptile can uh you know survive and thrive so okay and so um when is your book coming out and where can somebody purchase it well, that's a great question and our printer unfortunately is uh telling us different dates because there's I don't know if everybody knows there's a worldwide paper shortage. That was just something that I was made uh, aware of very recently. So we got the, uh, there's a few copies, um, you know, that I sent your way and I've got a copy here. And uh, those were kind of the, uh, uh, the books for us to, to look into proofread and whatever uh, we call those, the proof copies. And um, they're, they may not be at Daytona with me. We hope to have them there. I think we're going to charge um, 26 bucks a piece for the books. Um, and uh, you can order those. There's a small fee for shipping on top of that, but they can be autographed. But if I don't and am unable to have them by, uh, by the time Daytona rolls around, you can definitely contact me and I'll just uh, start mailing those. And hopefully they'll be here by the end of August. So we had hoped to have them a whole stack for everybody at Daytona, but, uh, we're just kind of unsure right now what uh, that that's going to be uh, doing. But you can get a hold of me through hognose1.com, uh, Facebook Messenger, Instagram. Um, I'm pretty much everywhere. So, yeah. Okay. And so now I want to pivot the conversation uh, to talking about the history of hog noses. We're going to cover several different topics. I love history. I love learning about the people that have been in the industry the longest and um, basically hearing about their experiences of hog noses when they started compared to like where it is now. So um, a guy that you mentioned, your friend, uh, John Lynch, um, how long have you known him and how long have y'all been um, dealing with hog nose snakes? 
Well, John Lynch, it's an interesting story. You know, I, I used to be involved in the wholesale wild caught reptile trade, and that was just kind of where I found myself as a as a younger person, um, you know, going out into fields and catching checker garter snakes and desert king snakes and selling them to local pet shops. And before too long, we, you know, kind of worked a network and uh, began to expand our horizons and sell to other uh, entities. Well, I guess maybe around the early 2000s, I had a couple guys from Dallas that were really encouraging me to get into the captive trade. So we would still pull every once in a while from the wild collections, just like we do today, obtain permits and catch stuff for fresh blood. But really, that's not our our goal anymore. We've gone to strictly, you know, captive breeding. I, I breed uh, ornate box turtles, desert box turtles, three-toed box turtles, uh, tiger salamanders, desert king snakes, bull snakes, and morphs of all of those. So um, those are some of the species that we worked with and were able to sample, you know, populations. So in doing that, um, I had a, a, a gentleman and he knew uh, John Lynch in North Texas. John Lynch was living in Dalhart, Texas. And um, he said, hey, you need to contact this guy. You know, he likes um, hog nose too. So I went up there and and um, just actually called him. He's four, I guess, I guess it's about four hours away. And so called him up. He was a barber at a, uh, you know, had his own barber shop up there. And I was really surprised when I got to see his collection because in his collection, he had probably seven or eight animals from the original spider line. He had uh, uh, the original mocha and just a bunch of hognose, probably had 60 hognose, which blew my mind because the only people that I knew, at least in our area, that had that many hognose was Richard Evans, you know, in Lubbock. Uh, Ryan Blakely is another guy in, in Lubbock, Texas, Walter's World of Pets. Uh, he had a small hognose collection. He would get them in through time. Um, and then a few other guys, but it just was kind of cool to see somebody else that had a similar passion that had, you know, developed over time. And he really didn't know anybody. And John's kind of a, a mystery even today. I mean, you know him and you've talked to him, but he doesn't like the, the limelight. He doesn't like to be in the spotlight. So uh, he asked me to help him promote the spider line back when. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know, just... Uh, all in all, we got to be great friends and would swap stuff back and forth. And um, so, yeah, I mean, we just got to know each other through a mutual friend. I guess that was around maybe 2004. And, uh, you know, we've gone to shows together. We, you know, his family vacations with my family. You know, we're all good friends. And so it's been a really cool, uh, productive friendship. Yeah, and um, when I first got into hognose snakes, I bought your morph guide, and the spider morph was one of the main ones that caught my eye. And I was like, "Where, like, where is this morph? Like, I never saw anybody post it on Morph Market or anything like that." So, and I remember the name John Lynch because uh, you gave him credit in that book. So I was surprised when he reached out to me on Facebook, and he was just kind of. Uh, going over the history as well as in um, your your patterns book, you kind of go over the history of the spider gene. And for those who don't know what the spider gene, I'll have pictures uh, posted on his live stream. It's kind of similar to the the Woma pattern um, that was coined by Jeff Gelwood's Lemon Ghost line, but I feel like it's more it's a more exaggerated version of that. And I guess it's the original kind of Woma pattern, very yep. unique animal. Yeah, I think. Um... You know, going back to John Lynch, he he travels a lot, and he, uh, he he just picked up on your broadcast, and he listens to you while he's traveling. So he'll turn on the YouTube thing and just listen while he's going. He just loves. It's almost like picking up a podcast, you know. Um, but um, back to the the spider uh, groups, the stuff he was working with up there. Spider is like an exaggerated woman. Now there are woman that mimic or look almost just like the original spiders did where they're it's like a a double or a black bordered yellow stripe down the back that could be jagged uh but has patternless sides or semi-patternless sides so we've seen a couple woma come up like that um i know the original spider group came out of a pet shop in amarillo and so that was like 25 years ago 
and John did some swapping and picked up those guys from that. Uh, we worked that project for about seven or eight years, and we did produce examples from that. Um, there were a few issues early on with, uh, I know one time at John Lynch's place, there was uh, uh, an air conditioner malfunction, and it killed all his production. He had like 130 eggs from the original spider group, and uh, they were almost full term, but they, you know, they died, I guess, about maybe four or five weeks in. But we sliced all those eggs, and it was the most beautiful collection of, um, you know, that lineage. There must have been 15 that were, you know, striped and zigzag and lightning bolt pattern. And it was just unbelievable. But it was such a, a heartache, you know, because uh, there were so many that were that had died. I, I think he lost some lavenders. And I mean, that was early on when, you know, those bloodlines were were golden because the only thing that was out was maybe three recessive traits in the anacondas, you know, Arctic and super Arctic. They weren't released yet. Um, but uh, the interesting thing, and I kind of detail in my last book series, the pattern traits um, book, if you've got one or anybody's got one, uh, I, I display the, the spider the Woma Lemon Ghost and the Granite Jungle, because they all have a real similar look. And then similar to that, I know the Sable line when Dan, Dan Eby collected the parents of the Sables out of the wild. Um, at least historically, he would go out and sample the wild, just like, you know, most of the rest of us do, but it was in Montana. And, and uh, when he brought those animals in captivity and started working those lines, there's another you know, line of snakes that look similar to the spider, lemon ghost, woma, granite jungle. And then Court Gaverth had his that he was working for a while. And uh, so there were several lines that I think all have uh, a similar inheritance. So I know for a fact that granite jungle was found right outside of Lubbock, Texas, like 40 miles out. I know the spider line was found two hours north of that near uh, Amarillo, Texas. And uh, we've searched in that area and never come up with anything, you know, too much. He had a, John Lynch had a couple animals come in years and years later that were similar looking enough to the original spiders, but they weren't, um, um, you know, they just, I don't know if they weren't compatible or just didn't have the same production out of them. Uh, we don't know where the lemon ghost Woma came from. I mean, if you've got two populations you know here in north texas that kind of popped up individually those traits could pop up anywhere over the range so there's really no telling i know jeff told me that he'd been working that bloodline for about 20 years now um and then we've seen a few more through the years that have popped up there was a beautiful red one that came out of central texas and not much was ever done with that but um you know, there's just uh, populations that produce that particular um, trait. So something very cool for sure. Yeah, and John, he was showing me a picture of this special hog nose that came from the original uh, spider male, and uh, he coined the yellow glow. Um, do you remember that morph? Yeah, and it's it's kind of interesting. You know, the the yellow glow hatched the same year that the that the heat issue happened. So, but it, you know, survived to adulthood. Um, it was bright yellow with dark, almost black saddles. Um, so that was what was something that was very unusual about it. Um, but it's curious that, you know, the, the granite jungle line has, I've seen really bright yellow animals. And then we've got the uh, lemon ghost Woma and we've seen, you know, the lemons you know, that are really beautiful in that. And I know Jeff has used several different bloodlines to make the lemons what they are, but I still think that each one of those lines has a distinct um, yellow. I would have to ask Dan E.B. about it, but I know that he was, he had some um, sables for a while that were really bright and colorful, like pastels. He was calling vivid sables originally. This has probably been, I don't know, maybe around, 2010, 11, 12, before he knew Sable was a recessive trait. So I think a lot of those same lines 
for whatever reason, uh, there's always like a pastel gene that's associated with that, um, you know, spider, lemon, ghost, woma, granite jungle trait. Um, but the, the yellow glow was the prettiest, brightest yellow that I've seen um, on one. Um, I hatched out one from the granite jungle line that was as yellow, but had red saddles instead of the dark, you know, almost black. So just curious, but super cool that each one of the lines is, has been almost, you know, the same, um, you know, same effects or same phenotype, but just from different population pools, you know? Okay. And what about the, the mocha gene or that pattern? Was that originated in Texas as well? It was actually the mocha was, um, somebody that knew John called him and said, Hey, there's a, I've got a little snake over here and it had, there was a big rainstorm there and that little, the original mocha, you know, with those massive square saddles, she was probably 15, 18 grams. And she had crawled into like a warehouse just to get out of the, the flash flooding that was going on outside. So he raised her up to, um, um, to adulthood and then she produced multiple animals and uh if you've seen like in our book we featured um the zebra mochas that lou chavez out of cowtown reptiles out of fort worth had produced uh he was the first buyer for the mochas uh that we had he he ended up getting a pair and that's what he produced was the zebra mocha so that's another one too that has a similar pattern to that you know tiger banding and almost uh you know, spider lemon ghost woma look with the, you know, big blushed saddles down the side. Uh, Mocha has thrown some stuff like that too. So that's one I forgot about, but um, yeah, that's uh, that's the origin of the Mocha. There are a few animals in that area of North Texas that we had seen that uh, have looked similar, big blotch like that, really dark, um, you know, dark saddles on like a white or lighter background. So they just produce, they're, they're something I would consider an enhancer uh, for morphs. You know, we, we hatched out some brand new stuff this year with the granite jungles, hatched out some mocha arctic uh, granite jungle anacondas that were really cool. So that's a new project for us. So I think anything mocha is thrown into, um, especially if, if it's not too, too many generations out, you have some, you know, good enhancements for the hognose morphs. Okay. And so you just mentioned some of uh, the projects that you're working on this year. It seems like you had a, a pretty good year. So kind of run us down on some of uh, your other projects that you've um, had success with this year. So this year was kind of cool. You know, I had a um, I had a female possible double head sable pistachio. So she also well, she was Arctic. And so I crossed her with a double head storm cloud male. And that was one of my earliest pairings this year. And I was just anticipating uh, Sable and maybe Arctic Sable, but I ended up hatching out a storm cloud, which was a big surprise for me. That was my first storm cloud. And of course, you know, you post a picture of an animal and somebody snatches it up. So it was sold before it even got feeding or anything, you know, it was gone out the door. So that was a really cool deal for us. And then some remarkable looking, um, out of the same clutch, remarkable looking Arctic sables, you know, the black ice. Um, one of my featured has like a really unusual kind of army helmet green color with uh, blushing that's kind of an orange. And I do believe that's probably most likely from the sable gene. Sable are extremely variable. You know, they produce some really neat uh, colors. Um, and maybe, you know, coming back to what what Dan had coined, you know, vivid sables from back when. Um, some of the other stuff we hatched, you know, just this week, I wasn't anticipating hatching them, but uh, got some, and we'll see them here in a minute. Uh, I did hatch shadow Arctic anaconda um, albinos. And so this line that I've been working with produces a really, really nice silver Arctic anaconda. And so they just have a, an overall silver color that from the dorsum looks like an azanthic. But when you turn them over, you know, they've got some yellow and orange on the, like the vent scale and some of the, you know, colors. So it's not actually uh, an azanthic. 
But when you cross that dark gray color into the albino, and I wasn't anticipating albinos coming out of that, that was a surprise hat, but the babies look like uh, almost as, as pink as the snow. So they look like pastel pink almost, but you can see little tidbits of orange. So I think that they are best classified shadow Arctic um, albino anaconda. So triple A shadows, but they're really sharp. I uh, showed off a picture and one of them went today. So I'm down to one of those left that I'll either bring to Daytona or put up on Morph Market pretty soon, as soon as she gets going. Um, yeah, those are a couple of the uh, projects that I had this year that that proved out for me. We're still waiting on several clutches. I'll, I've got clutches being laid right now. So I thought I was done. We've had five waves of eggs this year which is crazy i've never had five waves it's always been one or two or maybe like two in the spring and then one in the fall but for whatever reason they just keep cycling 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 uh had one snake this year that did four clutches which is astronomical to me two of them were fertile and then the last two were infertile but she just continued to produce so um we did uh, Mocha Arctic Granite Jungle Anaconda, like I was talking about. Uh, I'm trying to think what else. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's all I can think of right now that we did this year. Okay. So what does the shadow gene do? Because to me, it kind of looks similar to the Mocha. What's the difference between the two in terms of how they visually look? So shadow, we've always, or at least, if you'll read through the morph guide, like, transitioning from the morph guide to the pattern trait or the any of the traits books trait series i'm learning and evolving in my descriptions so a lot of times they seem to differ or we tend to learn stuff as we do multiple generations so shadow we've we've classified as um a polygenic line trait with dominant elements and there's a lot of traits that I classify that with. Uh, I think the woman, lemon, ghost, the spider, the granite jungle, all of those are line traits that have specific elements. And you can cross those or outcross those and still get dominant effects. So sometimes the traits will be dominant to another. But to specifically answer your question, the uh, I would consider the, the shadow trait more of a color morph. And I think they were one of the ones that I listed in the color traits book if I... Um, if I'm thinking right. Anyway, they uh, tend to have like a darker gray, sometimes a brown saddle, sometimes a green saddle. It tends to be blocky like the mocha is, but a smaller blotch. Um, they've got these irregular um, skin colorations, this black skin colorations that's kind of patchy in between the saddles. Um, they have real defined eyebrows, so it's almost like you know, right above the eye, it's, it'll either um, almost attach or be, you know, two dots on either side of the eye. So they've just got a, an overall gray look with, uh, like I said, a greenish or a brownish, sometimes a maroonish pattern. Uh, one of the other traits typically with them is on the belly, they'll have a solid black belly, but subcaudally, which just means, um, you know, under the tail, on the underside of the tail, they'll have uh, from the vent to the end of the tail, the white from like the border will bleed in or blend in or they'll have checkering there. So most lines that I've seen don't have coloration or much coloration from the vent to the tail tip. But the shadow, it just seems like those white parts just kind of bleed in. So that's something that I've seen consistently with the you know, maybe 60 shadow combos I've, you know, worked with in the past. So sometimes you'll get black eyes with shadow. Um, yeah, so they're they're definitely an enhancer, you know, for, for other traits. Okay. And so now I want to talk specifically about the gene that I know um, that I guess is associated with you the most, and that's the granite jungle. Like I always promote it on my channel. And um, I think it has great potential. And um, we just saw Eddie Pierce. Um, he combined one of your granite jungles with an Arctic lemon ghost. And the, the results were amazing. And I paired my lemon ghost Woma to a granite jungle that you produced. Um, 
And you just made a video kind of detailing the history of it. So just give a give us a brief description of the granite jungle and how you came about that. And what is the potential in terms of combining it with other morphs, um, whether it's color morphs or uh, recessives or incomplete dominant genes? Yeah. So um, granite jungle, the population that, you know, exists pretty close here is a stable hognose population that's been pulled out of for probably, you know, 20 years. And before me, uh, I had a friend that lived in the area and they found hognose all the time. And hognose are by far the most common, you know, snake in that area. So he would see them all the time and always was bringing me some that he would find in the yard and, you know, whatnot. So they, that population has been pulled for a while. And I guess maybe in 2010, I had a, a, another hognose breeder from overseas, Richard Sawden. I don't know if you've ever heard that name. But he had encouraged me and said, hey, you need to be breeding out these animals that you're bringing out of the wild and uh, really breeding them down to first and second generation to see if there's any recessive traits. And it was a great idea and something that was a new undertaking for me, uh, because typically we would just hold on to them until the first generation to see if there was, you know, an immediate recessive trait. But if you think about it, if they bred any you know, anything that was not part of their lineage, unless it was a dominant trait, it wasn't going to, you know, you weren't going to know first generation. You needed to breed down to the F2. So saying all that to say, I started just hanging on to everything that I was finding and actually pursuing, you know, females from that population. And before too long, I started seeing um, a lot of traits that reminded me of the spider. So it was like the banding that would come down the side but it would open up and blush right in the center and let me let me just use one of my examples here because it it uh is case in point so this is one of the prettiest of the well, let's see if we can get it to go close so if you can see the blushing that's going on there right in the center or each one of those bands is like a tiger band but it breaks and so what you're having going on there is just a really unusual pattern. But this guy right here reminds me of John Lynch's original spider male. This one is an F1. His mother was wild collected in 2019, I believe it was. And just remarkable animal, something that I was just really excited, you know, about working with. So it was a two egg clutch. She laid five eggs and three were infertile. And she was, you know, gravid from the wild. But um, when when I would have sim similar, you know, snakes hatch out, I started going, man, maybe there's something to this. Maybe there's something right here that, you know, is on par with, you know, lemon ghost woma. So the first ones I hatched out were in, let's see, I bought anacondas. I bought two anacondas from a gentleman in 20... 12. Those were my first snakes when I got back into hognose. I went through a bad divorce in 2010, sold everything I had, every single animal except for like five southern hognose. So when I got back into it, my buddy I was talking about that lived on the farm, he caught three female hognose for me and I bought two anacondas. And that's when anacondas were like 1100 bucks. You know, they were not, not cheap. But the first one I had, I crossed with one of those wild females. In first generation, I had, you know, the it was a female that is, is in some of my uh, pictures you can see online, just had that unusual look to her. And so I began to line breed those and, uh, and then even did like outcrosses and just to see what I could come up with and could see that there were dominant elements. You know, I would produce a granite jungle or granite jungle anaconda, you know, when I would do outcrosses. So like, for instance, the male here, this male is the dad of yours. And he's got a, I'll turn this light on here and see if we can pick up on his, it's hard to get the lighting to go right. It's either too bright or too dark, but I'll hold him closer. You can see it's got kind of a green tinge to him. And this male is an F4, F4, no, he's an F3. So your girl would be an F4 to 
the wild lineage. Now, if you look at the belly, there's yellow and orange flecking, but granite jungle, I've never to date seen a yellow belly or an increasing, uh, what we would call a decreasing melanin gene like the uh, lemon uh, ghosts often do where they go completely yellow except for, you know, subcaudally, um, you know, on the tail. I've never seen a granite jungle do a solid yellow belly ever. So that's something that's different in this line. But you can kind of tell um, one of the traits of granite jungle is the um, what I call the lane splitting. And that's just like a wide stripe that starts at the neck and goes down, especially the first 50 percent of the body. So. You're going to get that with this particular bloodline. Um, they're beautiful colors. We get granite jungle that are orange. Uh, we don't get deep reds, but we get kind of a reddish color, uh, greens, yellows. So, you know, they can be fairly variable. I got another one here that we'll look at that's probably what I would consider a nominant version. This one here, you can kind of see some kind of greens and, again, just not the best. And then you can see the belly. Yeah, there's a good view of the belly. So the belly's got brown, orange patches, yellow patches, black patches, but it still will not totally, you know, brighten up. It stays about the same throughout their entire life. So, um, yeah, that's kind of the history of that particular line, the Granite Jungle. And I think that they're compatible with the uh, Lemon Ghost Woma, you know, we started producing those in 20, I think I said 2012. And then in 2015, when I bought my Arctic possible het um, albinos that, that uh, sired uh, the uh, first Sub-Zero, uh, I bought a Lemon Ghost Woma from, from Jeff Galewood, hoping that I could cross these and get something figured out. But unfortunately, I got a dud, and so I didn't ever hatch any Woma out to them. It was really uh, discouraging because I was hoping to do the same thing that we're just now getting to. Yeah. Okay, so um, maybe a few weeks ago, uh, I made a video um, detailing uh, some of the things that I see are going to start happening more in the future um, as we advance in the hognose community, such as we're going to start seeing more um visual three recessive genes um mm -hmm. i think super arctic is going to be incorporated in um two recessive visual genes and then the third thing i said was people are going to focus a lot more on the base colors so with your granite jungle um you typically see that nice yellow base color and the granite jungle you sold to me is more yellow than both of my pure lemon ghosts and I saw um, Esalen from Exotic Firehogs. He just posted today this um, this lavender super conda. And I think it one of the parents was like a, a yellow. I'm not sure what line it was, but it had a, it was come from a yellow super conda. And it just changed the way the lavender looked. Oh, that's so cool. in, yeah. So in terms of um, like base colors, what do you what do you think the potential is for the granite jungle in terms of combining it with, like with other recessive genes? Um, man, I think that, um, uh, I think it's a big potential, you know, I think that, um, uh, we're getting where we're going with the, um, let's just say it's like the engine of the NASCARs, you know, we've perfected the engines and that would be the, uh, um, the recessive traits, but now it's time to put the coat on and put the color on and, you know, really enhance any of those recessive traits with colors, you know, just like you're saying. Um, we've had a lot, just a huge demand for yellow, for green, for red. You know, we, we've we kind of already done the darker morphs and the super bright morphs. And I think a lot more people want to go towards, uh, you know, how can we enhance stuff? Um, the lemon lavenders that came out a couple of years ago, Chris, uh, Chris Sithchai over in uh, California, 
Uh, he was the first one to come out with a lemon lavender. And like you said, they just have an overall different look to them. You know, they're just a beautiful animal. I haven't had a chance to see Eslins yet. Um, but see, that's, that's where we're going with it. We're taking something that's been around for how long is a lavender, you said it was a lavender super. Yeah. How long has the lavender super been around for, you know, several years, but now it's like, let's take it to a different level by crossing, you know, more yellow into it. I mean, who would have thought yellow, you know, and, um, we're starting to see that, you know, we've just had a huge demand, like I said, for raging red stuff or, granite jungle for pastel and it's just like i can't even meet demand you know right now i'm looking at maybe not even having animals to bring to daytona if you can believe that because the demand is so high that we can't meet it you know uh, but it's for the stuff that people want to take to enhance you know the fingernail polish if you will to really make something pop um but yeah i think that's where uh, the future is, you know, um, not to mention those of us who are doing three and four and five gene combiners, you know, it's just, uh, this is really where it's at. And, um, another thing that I find unique about yourself is that you do incorporate wild blood into your collection. I feel like you're one of the only people that, that do that. And so in terms of doing that, um, is it only like Texas that you really see people incorporating wild blood? I know they have like different laws in different states to where you can't really um, take them out of the wild. Um, how, how common do you think that is? Um, like as far as breeding? Like yeah. Like, yeah. From a wild population, I guess. Yeah. I don't think it's very common at all. Now I know, you know, I've heard that people have pulled, stuff from some of the eastern populations of dusky and gloidi hognose um it's been a while you know it's just been a while there are a few breeders that do it you know i know um uh, i think the fords um chevy ford and and uh his wife I, I think they have access to or have you know gotten wild blood to mix into stuff if i'm not mistaken uh there's a few guys in some other places that do it also, but yeah, it's not too common. We just, and, and I see a huge push for it. I, I've got a huge demand for it. You know, people really want to get wild blood uh, crossed into their stuff because they're seeing deliterous effects. You know, they're at least the people that are, if they don't talk about it publicly, they'll definitely talk about it privately. So I have people all the time that really want to get, you know, they want to plug a powerhouse male into uh, a wild blood female. And, uh, unfortunately for us this year, we had like 30 wild blood, you know, males and five, uh, wild blood females. So we've been very limited, you know, to try to meet the demand, but I would encourage anybody, even if you've got a powerhouse female, use one of the males that's, you know, from the wild, cross it into your stuff. It just, it really can't hurt. You know, the stuff that's in the wild is really a sentinel, animal they've developed you know positive uh they've evolved positively you know with what we call creature fitness to be able to survive you know the fact that they could make it to adulthood uh means that there are not issues you know that would cause them to be so slow and stupid that every hawk or badger coming along eats them you know so um yeah i just am a huge proponent for it uh i see less uh, diseases and, and things like that with a, even with the wild caught stuff than I do with the, the captive bred stuff. I've had more issues with, with mites, with, uh, even snake ticks with, uh, Oh, I'm think, think of what else, um, regurgitation, cryptosporidium, all that stuff's come out of captivity, you know? And I think it's multi-species keepers. A lot of times there's people that don't really quarantine well, you know, it's, it's hard to, you know, have a $500 show rack, how do you clean those things from crypto, you know? And so we're working with a guy right now and designing um, three tiered or five tiered uh, show displays that have disposable tubs because, um, you know, if you put an animal with crypto in there or if you buy from a wholesaler and they put a Savannah monitor in there that was 
caught in Africa, you know, and then there's a corn snake the next show, and then there's a hognose snake the next show, and you buy it, and you, you know, have cryptosporidium saurophyllum, you know, and it came from that display. You know what I mean? It's a complex deal. So, um, yeah, it's um, the wild caught stuff, I think, has had a bad rap for a while. And I think your more aquatic or aquaneous species, maybe like eastern hognose, um, because they're, you know, in a kind of a waterborne or riverine or, um, you know, whatever situation, they're, they may be more prone to, you know, having issues. But at least the drier species, I've seen a lot less issues with uh, those type diseases. The issue with them is sometimes just getting them to feed well. And, you know, that's been the hurdle to kind of tackle or having them come in and they're just they look like they've been butchered by a, a farm implement, you know, because they have. So. OK. And so uh, to kind of conclude this interview, what projects are you most excited about going into next year? Going into next year, I think kind of like what you're talking about combining colors into certain types of, you know, recessive traits, um, man, hatching out these little pink guys. And I want to, I want to show off a lot of this stuff too, when we conclude here, or before we conclude, um, just the colorations that are different. I want to, you know, really want to incorporate, incorporate those into a lot of stuff just to see, um, I'm trying to think of, all of them I want to go for. I think we're looking at right now, like Anaconda and Superconda, Raging Red. I hope to do that next year. I think, you know, Scott, the originator is going to be doing that already. So he might have some of those at Daytona. I don't know. Um, I think albino versions would be fantastic to see. Sable versions would be really cool. Um, that's, that's kind of what I'm looking at. And then I'm looking at doing some more, you know, Sable combo projects next year. Uh, I'm working with like um, the uh, permafrost. You know, I think permafrost is still a very, very underrated morph. If you've ever seen the blues and the blue hues that some of the adults have, it's just, I don't know. It's just something you really kind of won't forget. So uh, that's some of the stuff that I'm excited about doing and maybe seeing that, that other people are doing. Um, get maybe albino permafrost mixed in there and some of that. You, you can kind of see where I'm going with some of those projects. But, um, yeah, and mixing colors into them as well. You know, I hope to do granite jungle and sable, you know, maybe get some yellow and, you know, see see how they look. And so we'll see, see how that goes. Okay. And uh, so you said that you have a few more hog noses you want to show off. Uh, I know you mentioned the... Um, the Arctic and the Conda albinos. Yeah, we'll, uh, yeah, let's look at those. So this is the silver, um, just an Arctic anaconda. And so this is the albino version of that. I'm hoping the pinks are showing up and the eye almost looks like a snow eye or a coral eye. And then this one over here, Man, I'm hoping it comes in good. It does. So just phenomenal. Almost looks like a snow anaconda. And I showed it to somebody else, and they were like, is that a pastel pink? It's just unbelievable. Now let me see if I can find their sibling that's buried in here that's uh, just a regular old AAA. And that'll give you a good contrast because you can see the oranges on her, kind of tangerine orange, typical AAA you know, compared to well, next, let's look at they just fed today and I disturbed one and it regurged. So that's never fun. So we'll skip out on what, looking at that one. Can this one, you see this one? Okay. Yes. Okay, so this is a mocha arctic granite jungle anaconda. So some of the traits with the granite jungle, and I forget on your animal if, if her neck flag looks like a little blunt bubble like this one, or if it looks like a long skinny stick that's flat on the end. Yeah, it's but, more it's more longer. Okay. 
typically granite jungle have two different neck, neck flags. One's blunt like this one here. And then um, the other one is long and straight. Okay. That's the son of yours right there from October. Okay. So you see how the neck flag does? It's just flat and then it just kind of cuts off at the back. It doesn't bring to a point like a lot of bloodlines. That's just a classic. Um, and where I'm talking about is just like right in here. When you get from the neck flag point to the pattern, it just kind of shuts off. It's parallel. And that's that's just something signature with almost every single granite jungle, whether it's anaconda, arctic, whatever. Now, sometimes with the arctics, they'll uh, they'll do crazy, you know, weird fleur de lis, just like the arctic already does. But you can see on that that one there, just the uh, lane splitting, and it's got an overall gray color, but it's also got that kind of mocha. I don't know how to describe just um just like a soil brown how close are we getting on your eggs man um august 9th sweet right before the show right before the show all right let's look at an arctic granite jungle anaconda and i think that'll be the last one that we'll look at here tonight so with her she's kind of a brown and yellow but you can still see the Arctic markers on the face and whatever. So I'm just unsure how they're going to combine. But I might, I might use one of those uh, albino Arctic anacondas with her and see, you know, what, what would combine. You can see the little red flecks, hopefully, on the background pattern. But she's got pretty good lane splitting. Was there anything else you wanted me to touch on that you could maybe add in that we didn't cover? Um, I think that's about it for this video. Uh, unless there's anything else you wanted to add or promote. I know you will be at Daytona. Uh, what booth will you be at? We're going to be at booths 60 to 62. So those three booths, John will have one of those, and then Braden and I will have the other one. So. Okay. And if, uh, you know, if people come by and, you know, there's just a banner and a sold out sign, you'll know what's up. So it's been a good year for snake sales, man. We hate to, you know, not have anything to, to vend, but that just may be the case, you know, for us this year. Okay. And I know you said earlier in this video, um, if somebody wants to contact you, whether to get your new book or any of your old books or even reach out for a hog no snake from you. Where can they find you at um, on the internet or via social media? Yeah, they can find me on uh, on Facebook or Instagram, and uh, just you know, search by name. You can go to uh, hognose one dot com for an, just an email link, and we're responsive to that. Uh, you can go to Morph Market. We've got an account there on Morph Market. I think it comes up under South Plains Reptile uh, for them. Or you can just go on Google and punch in Kevin Rhodes, R-H-O-D-E-S, and the word hog nose with it. And it brings up all kinds of links to um, any of the YouTube vids and even the uh, direct link to our book printer where you can order directly from there also uh, if you so desire. And is your discount code still active? Yeah, we've got a discount code. And I think we're going to do that through December 31st. And so just use the code 2022, so 2022, and that will save you. Uh, there's different percentages for different ones of the books, but just punch that in and see what kind of a discount you get off that. And uh, the discounts range, uh, I think they're 15 to 20%, something like that. So anyway, it's definitely save you a little few bucks in there. Okay. Yeah. And I had the link down in my description with the discount code, as well as the link to the website where you can get his books. And uh, I appreciate you for um, coming on my channel again, doing another interview. Uh, we'll definitely have to do more interviews in the future. And I'll definitely be at Daytona this year. Um, I get to meet you in person as well as every, all the other hog nose breeders. 
um, John Lynch, I'll be at your table. You can show me um, some of the hog noses that you bring and uh, we'll have a good time. Yeah, man. Thank you for uh, promoting the stuff. Always. You always give a shout out and a mention and I appreciate that, man. All right. So we're going to conclude this interview. Um, I appreciate everybody that's going to watch it. Um, definitely subscribe to his uh, Kevin Rhodes YouTube channel. Um, I'll leave that in the description as well. And we'll see y'all for the next time. And I now have a Patreon account for those who want to support me even further. Here you will have access to exclusive videos, giveaways, as well as discounts. The link will be in the bottom in the description. And if you purchase Repi links, feel free to use the discount code SHOVELHOGS to receive 5% off of all purchases.